Good afternoon, everybody. Today is Thursday, July 15th, 2021. Welcome to our 27th iGerry Care Live event. The topic today is vascular dementia. And uh, I'm really pleased, as always, to have uh, co founder and uh, geriatrician extraordinaire, Dr. Richard Stramko, uh, joining us today. So thank you very much, Richard. And uh, welcome. Hope your summer is going okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's great. Great to see you again, Anthony. Um, so uh, why don't we dive right in there? We've we've been talking in uh, some of our previous live events doing a, a somewhat deeper dive with respect to the different types of dementia. Uh, we had one uh, previous live event on Parkinsonism and Lewy body dementia. So we thought we'd uh, dive in uh, with a bit more of a discussion of vascular dementia. Um, our usual format applies. We'll try to uh, stick to the whole event being uh, about 45 minutes and we'll start off with the first 15 or 20 minutes with some background on the condition and uh, then we'll take uh, questions that have come in. We uh, really appreciate uh, people who have sent in questions during uh, the week leading up to the live event. We'll try to cover items that are specifically related to vascular dementia uh, first and then if we still to other types of dementia. So uh, let's, let's write in there. Uh, how do you vascular dementia? My apologies. I think my internet connection is a little bit uh, <laughs> slow there. Um, so vascular dementia is related to um, low blood flow in the brain or damage in the vascular system or blood vessels uh, to the brain. So um, if people have had a, a stroke in the past and they're left with cognitive impairment, so memory and thinking changes after they've had that stroke and it impairs their day-to-day -day function, then you could say that that is a vascular dementia. So they're kind of the large strokes that everybody is more aware of where you know somebody can't move their arm or can't move their leg or is slurring their speech perhaps um and uh if somebody has had that they've gone to the hospital they've had some ct scans or an mri and proven that they've had a stroke and the cognitive impairment takes place after that, that then you can consider them having a vascular dementia um, there are other times though where there are smaller parts of the brain that can be impacted um, with a, a small stroke and people might not necessarily present to the hospital right away with those. Um, and it could be a subclinical stroke, meaning people don't have a lot of symptoms, but people will notice a decline in their cognition. And you might not be able to pick up on that stroke on a CT scan, uh, but sometimes an MRI is required and you'll pick up and you'll see that they might've had a small uh, stroke after the fact. And so you can tie the cognitive decline that they experienced first to the uh, small stroke that they had. And there are certain parts of the brain that are very important that do a lot of the heavy lifting. For example, the thalamus would be an example where if you had a small stroke in the thalamus, you could have really significant memory and thinking problems. Yeah, I think then, that's a really, a really good point that the, the findings in vascular dementia, what the person is experiencing or what the care partner may be seeing are highly variable. Uh, just, uh, just to sort of recap, um, probably about 10% of people actually with vascular dementia have it uh, diagnosed even before they've even had a known stroke, but they've probably had these uh, smaller uh, episodes or strokes in areas that didn't come to clinical attention because they, they didn't have you know paralysis or another obvious finding. And then um, after a first stroke, I think about 10% of people will go on to develop uh, vascular dementia. And uh, those people who might have repeated strokes uh, are at highest risk with about a third of people with repeated strokes uh, eventually going on to have vascular dementia. But it really does depend on the location of the stroke, the size of the stroke. And uh, as you said, sometimes there are these uh, uh, people may have had these small episodes that they weren't even aware of uh, that may affect uh, their cognition in different ways. 
Mm -hmm. And you know what you're what we're describing both uh, if there's sudden loss of blood flow to a certain part of the brain, then you'd also experience a very abrupt decline in the cognitive function if that were the underlying cause. And so what people will describe is an abrupt step uh, decline. And if you have multiple strokes, you'll have this stepwise decline in cognitive function over time with the more abrupt decline happening every time that there's one of those vascular events. And I think definitely great call in pointing out the size and location. And I think also the difference between um, uh, a, a thrombotic stroke where somebody loses blood flow because of a blood clot blocking blood flow in that blood vessel versus a hemorrhagic stroke um, where the blood vessel actually starts leaking blood into the brain and causing damage that way. Um, and then finally, there's a small blood vessel disease that can happen very slowly and gradually over time. Um, sometimes people will get it just with age and it won't actually contribute to the uh, cognitive impairment. There's lots of people that you'll get an MRI and you'll see it, but they won't have any cognitive impairment. But as that damage accumulates over time, when it reaches a certain threshold in some people, then it can start causing memory and thinking problems. And so that's called a subcortical microvascular disease. The other people might call it Binswangers or subcortical um, uh, vascular um, cognitive impairment. And so kind of what we're describing here is that dementia is an umbrella term, which means many different things, Alzheimer's, vascular disease, uh, frontotemporal dementia, but we're kind of describing as well that vascular cognitive impairment, sometimes causing mild cognitive impairment, sometimes causing uh, full-blown dementia is a bit of an umbrella term and has several different subsets uh, within it as well. And I think, you know, we use the term vascular dementia for this uh, presentation or for this talk because it's the most commonly used term, the vascular cognitive impairment has come into favor as well because not everybody has vascular dementia. There's a prodromal mild cognitive impairment where people can still function independently on their own as well um, for some people. And that, that's a really, actually, we, we've already got a, a really good question that ties in uh, well to this, that is it only strokes that cause vascular dementia? How would you, how would you address uh, that? I mean, I guess, uh, what we've been talking about is sometimes you may have uh, vascular changes uh, that don't necessarily present with strokes. Uh, we we may think of them as still, um, you know, small blood vessel strokes. They just went without getting diagnosed. But I guess it's possible to have, you know, narrowing of arteries or cholesterol buildup, other types of uh, vascular disease that may affect cognition without it necessarily being a stroke per se. Yeah. And the reason we use atherosclerosis, which is the cholesterol buildup and inflammatory plaques that happen in the arteries is because it's such a common age related pathology, meaning it just increases and it's so prevalent and it causes many different things. So, you know, if it's in your heart, it will cause heart attacks or angina. And if it's in your legs, it will cause um, symptoms of low blood flow there. Um, and if it's in your brain, then yes, uh, it can cause these some of these problems. And so the atherosclerosis that's there puts you at increased risk of having a stroke, right? Which we've described already, but also just the narrowing of those blood vessels can cause low flow, which may impair cognitive impairment or which may cause cognitive impairment. The other thing is that if you had an inflammatory condition, like uh, an autoimmune condition where your um, blood vessels are inflamed and your, uh, your immune system is attacking itself, that can cause the narrowing of those blood vessels. It presents usually much faster uh, with, with you know, slightly different symptoms, but that can also cause, cause problems there. And then if you go further down, so let's say you have valves in your heart and the aortic valve is a very important valve where all the blood flowing through to your entire body from your left ventricle outwards is dependent on that uh, blood flow coming out. And so there's one particular valve called the aortic valve, where if it gets to be very, very narrowed, and there's aortic stenosis or narrowing of that valve, you can get into a very low flow state with severe aortic stenosis. And people may 
have cognitive impairment secondary to low blood flow there. Mm. So it doesn't always have to be a stroke. It doesn't always have to be atherosclerosis. It can be a number of different diseases. Um, just vascular, the atherosclerotic disease is by far and away the most common cause, whether that's in the small micro vessels or it's in the larger vessels causing, causing stroke. Probably worth mentioning as well that, um, you know, as we've talked about dementia, an umbrella term, we've talked about the most common types of dementia and vascular dementia is thought to be the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. But because uh, vascular disease in general is quite common in the population, it's it's not uncommon for people to have a mix of vascular disease and possibly vascular dementia with other types of dementia, uh, like Alzheimer's disease mixed with uh, vascular disease, uh, leading to a, a mixed picture. And I think that's one, one of the things that can make it, uh, we will be talking a bit about what are, what are some of the common symptoms, uh, of vascular dementia. Uh, but keep in mind that it can sometimes be a bit confusing if somebody might have a mix of vascular dementia with, uh, Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia with Lewy body disease, for example. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's helpful. Um, I guess do you want to get into the symptoms then? Yeah, let, yeah. Let's yeah. let's let's describe some of the uh, the typical symptoms of say a uh, quote unquote pure vascular dementia. Sure, and it's always nice to contrast it with Alzheimer's just because it's so so common. But people will uh, with vascular dementia generally will have more severe executive function problems. So we've talked before about the ability to plan events and solve problems and organize your day, perhaps do multitasking or switching between tasks, being attentive and how quickly you can process information. So those types of things, generally, uh, you'll notice them first in your instrumental activities of daily living. So the shopping and bill payment finances, and food preparation for more complex uh, meals and stuff. Those are the, the areas where people will notice problems first. They're just more severe than they are in Alzheimer's disease. Memory problems uh, can be there as well, but they're generally less severe than in Alzheimer's disease. And the big difference is that, um, you know, people can store information, but they have more of a challenge with retrieving that information. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, people have a hard time storing any new information. So if you cue people that have vascular dementia to things that have taken place, they can generally remember them mm. with mild and moderate disease, whereas people with more, you know, more moderate Alzheimer's disease won't even be able to remember those things as well. And then oftentimes you'll see more pronounced apathy, probably not as severe as a frontotemporal dementia, let's say, but more severe than an Alzheimer's patient to begin with. And some emotional lability as well. And very frequently, there's concomitant depression as well, just because of the areas that are impacted uh, also regulate your your mood. So th- those are the more common things. And, you know, uh, depending on where the stroke is, as we've described to, you know, we can't get into all of that because the brain is a very complex organism. So or, uh, organ. Um, so anywhere that you can have a stroke, uh, you can have a, quite a quite a different uh, um a wide array of of different symptoms. So we won't get into that, but the more common presentation that we're talking about right here is uh, is what we've described. And And I I would say as as the psychiatrist, I'm definitely seeing patients who are having more of those depressive symptoms or the apathy and uh, people, you know, I think one of the other questions that came in is, is, is personality change involved in vascular dementia. And I would say that is one of the things that we do sometimes see is somebody who maybe used to be um, enthusiastic or highly uh, motivated or driven and and may now appear, you know, less interested, less motivated, or having these symptoms of apathy. Maybe somebody was happy-go-lucky before, and now they seem, you know, more depressed. And uh, as you mentioned, while while we do see uh, some of these behavioral and personality changes really prominently 
in some of the other types of dementia, especially the frontotemporal dementia, depending on the location of some of the vascular disease, if it's in those front parts of the brain, uh, as you mentioned, we'll often see some of those similar kinds of personality or behavior changes. People may get uh, more disinhibited or labile. In other words, they, they may have less control over their emotions. They may suddenly react to something uh, with irritability or anger uh, or sadness that they might not have um, done in the past. So it can definitely look like a, a change in personality if they're having some of those symptoms. And I would say those in terms of some of the psychiatric types of symptoms, those are the types of symptoms that people with a vascular dementia, depression, anxiety, apathy, and less prominently the sort of delusions and hallucinations that sometimes sees in some of the other dementias when they're moderately uh, advanced. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a great point. I've, I had a, a younger gentleman who was in his early sixties um, came in and he had all of the cardinal manifestations of or most common uh, typical manifestations of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. I thought for sure, you know, he, he had it, uh, but I had an MRI and, and sure enough, he had a frontal lobe stroke on the, mm -hmm. in the right front frontal lobe. Um, so it's interesting to see. And then, you know, um, rare, rare presentations. Again, it's not common, but uh, another woman who had just a, felt a sudden pop in her head and had very rapid onset cognitive impairment ever since she heard that pop. And since that time, a black raven was coming to sing to her every day, mm -hmm. right? So very abrupt onset. And then again, had it uh, an MRI, which showed um, a subcortical stroke, and then she improved. So as you would expect, which you wouldn't expect if it was related to other disease pathology. So there's some kind of interesting stories there showing that you know, there's these common presentations that we describe first, and then there can be these slightly atypical presentations, which gets to, to why the neuroimaging or MRI is so important um, to ruling that out. And then a few other kind of ancillary symptoms that can go along with, with um, the vascular dementia are uh, incontinence, just because the frontal lobe plays such a, a major role in regulating your bladder and the voluntary control you have over the bladder. If there's damage there in the subcortical frontal regions, then um, then that can cause problems with incontinence and walking or gait abnormalities. People can have slower walking um, and uh, irregular step patterns, uh, feel less confident because the executive function is so important to how you make your way in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those those are kind of the most common things. Yeah. I, I did, um, you know, not everybody, if, if the history and the physical exam is, is very strongly suggestive and maybe some cognitive testing is very strongly suggestive of a vascular dementia, not everybody necessarily gets imaging or sometimes the imaging may differ. So sometimes a CT scan may be ordered, but that might be ordered more to rule out um, like a large bleed, like a, a hemorrhagic stroke, or it might be to rule out a tumor or something else because mm -hmm. it, the CT scan is not always that great for visualizing some of those uh, smaller, more subtle uh, strokes or vascular lesions. But I, I've put up here a, a somewhat characteristic MRI scan uh, that you might see in a moderately advanced uh, vascular dementia. And uh, what you're looking at, the, the white sort of uh, circle around is the uh, fat in the skull. Uh, the bone doesn't show up very well on the MRI. These two uh, big sort of black uh, things that look almost like butterfly wings in the middle of the scan are the the ventricles uh, inside the brain where the cerebral spinal fluid uh, flows and it flows around the brain as well. But what, um, what you can see, these little white patches uh, represent 
uh, vascular lesions where there's been uh, damage to uh, small blood vessels that feed uh, important pathways uh, that go in the brain. And actually there's in the normal brain, even in this other one that shows uh, uh, another example of it, you can see the ventricles appear to be a bit smaller. These ventricles are quite big. So there's been enough damage that has created some atrophy. So again, this, these are sometimes very helpful, as you say, uh, Richard, in, in making the diagnosis. If there's uncertainty, they're not always done and people don't always get an MRI scan if the history and the physical exam is strongly suggestive. But um, it, 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 this is kind of helps to explain what one might see in some types of vascular dementia where you may have had sort of multiple uh, small strokes with damage to uh, various parts of the brain that eventually lead to uh, cell death. And uh, it, it can affect uh, various cognitive functions, depending on all the various parts of the brain that might be affected. Is there anything else you wanted to say about yeah, imaging or? No, I, one thing I had, sorry, I neglected to mention was the Parkinsonism associated with, um, with vascular disease as well. So the, the parts of the brain, the basal ganglia that are really impacted and uh, cause um, the manifestation of, of Parkinson's like uh, symptoms can be impacted with that subcortical disease or a stroke in that area. And so people can appear as though they have a milder form of Parkinson's um, as well. With respect to the imaging, it's a little bit challenging now because um, so the, the Canadian consensus guidelines are now saying, you know, everybody that has cognitive impairment should get uh, should get an MRI. And as a I mean, it's a little bit challenging as a geriatrician because sometimes people are quite frail um, and they have more problems going on than just their cognitive impairment. Right. So they're falling all the time. They're malnourished. It's hard enough for their family to deal with them on a day to day basis. They have very high functional needs and they may be uh, barely getting by in the community. So kind of setting that person up for an hour long scan to get an MRI isn't really adv advised or possible. And it's not in keeping with their wishes. Um, and it's unlikely to change management. Right. Um, so it's, and it's a little bit of a change of like practice, I think. I don't know. We're kind of evolving into this because I think um, the more the, you know, high hotshot neurologists that do all of this, you know, uh, research are kind of finding a lot more prevalent um, the uh, subcortical infarcts and neuropath and the, the pathology when they're cutting brains open and stuff, they're seeing that there's a lot more of this. And then uh, another condition called cerebral amyloid angiopathy it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically it's the same protein that causes Alzheimer's disease, but it accumulates in the blood vessels in the brain and it puts people at a significant risk of having hemorrhages or bleeding within the brain. And unlike the usual brain hemorrhages we see or bleeding related to high blood pressure that happens in the subcortical regions that we've been talking about, um, the cerebral amyloid angiopathy can take, it happens more on the outer parts of the brain and the lobe. So people will have lobar hemorrhages in that case. And so you just, you know, um, that can contribute significantly to their cognitive impairment. And also um, if they've had hemorrhages in the past, you might want to avoid blood thinning medications that increase bleeding or antiplatelet medications like aspirin or Plavix, depending on what their underlying conditions are. Yeah, I um, think, I think it's a good, it's good just to highlight that, you know, the story is complicated and we are still learning more about uh, various uh, diseases. Um, stroke and uh, multiple strokes are probably, you know, the single biggest risk factors. People who have underlying cardiovascular disease, uh, that's the biggest risk factor for developing vascular dementia along with uh, age, like with many of the, the dementias. And then there are some of these folks who may have family histories of some of these uh, disorders that put them at increased risk of uh, vascular disease or hemorrhage, including some of the ones that you mentioned. Uh, and then, um, I, you know, I think the lesson that we have on promoting brain health talks about, you know, some of the things that you can do to reduce those what we call modifiable risk factors. So don't smoke, 
keep your blood pressure under control. High blood pressure is probably the single most important modifiable risk factor for stroke and vascular dementia. Um, manage your cholesterol and blood sugar. If you've got diabetes, do a, do as good a job as you can. Eat a healthy, balanced diet uh, like the Mediterranean diet. Uh, be physically active and exercise and, uh, you know, limit your alcohol consumption. Those Those things, many of which relate to vascular uh, blood vessel health are are all uh, things that you can do uh, irrespective of whether you haven't had a stroke yet and you're trying to prevent uh, you know blood cerebral vascular or or you know brain disease or vascular dementia or if you've had a stroke there may be other recommendations as you said in terms of um, you know stroke prevention that would be appropriate depending on the type of stroke that you've had and your risk factors. I'm, I'm going to jump in because we're just getting uh, tons of great questions, and I think we'll probably cover off some of them because they might be related to treatments, for example, or diagnosis. So um, so we've addressed the one, is it only strokes that cause vascular dementia? And we talked about personality change. What is, this is a very, very technical, well, what is microangiopathic white matter disease? Does it result in cognitive impairment? And I think we touched upon this briefly in the, the beginning. It's just the small blood vessel atherosclerotic disease usually uh, results in damages to and, and the white areas on that MRI scan that you so clearly outlined. So that's the, the microangiopathic disease we were talking about. And some people, like if you're very smart or have a high baseline intelligence and have lots of connections in your brain, you might have really quite significant disease there and it won't cause dementia. Whereas if you have, you know, less connections or your IQ at baseline is a little bit lower, then it might just take a little bit to push you over the edge. So it's not just whether it's there or not, it's the severity uh, that's there. And it also is um, dependent on, you know, the, the baseline number of connections yeah. you have in your brain. Is tinnitus a cause of vascular dementia? Uh, no. So tinnitus is the high pitched ringing uh, noise that people hear. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we all get it a bit temporarily. If you plug your ear in the wrong way, many people experienced it, but uh, generally it's not a cause. It couldn't, it can be associated with certain neurologic disease or uh, toxicity. Like if you take too much Advil or something like you can get, you can get or aspirin, you can get ringing in your ear rather. Um, and the hearing impairment is a risk factor for cognitive impairment, but tinnitus is not uh, not a, a manifestation not a cause. Yeah. that causes dementia. Um, so are there any medications that can help once it's diagnosed? So that's a good segue to talk about uh, treatments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and as you uh, so eloquently outlined, the, the treatments generally are just treating blood vessel health. So, um, you know, let, or finding causes of recurrent strokes. So if you have a heart rhythm problem, let's say atrial fibrillation, that would be something that's very common, very prevalent uh, as we age, where there's an irregular heart beat and um, blood vessel, um, sorry, blood does not flow smoothly through the heart. So uh, clots can form uh, in the heart and travel to the brain. So that's something very important. Anybody that has any neurologic manifestations or um, uh, stroke-like episodes will definitely get worked up with a Holter monitor to, to monitor and make sure that that's not there because it has such a high risk of stroke and the strokes are very, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're more intense than other, other types of strokes. So they tend to go to major blood vessels. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, then it's very important to get that worked up and very important to be on the blood thinners that are associated to reduce your risk of stroke. So that's important blood pressure medication. So, uh, ACE inhibitors are very common to use post-stroke. Um, any kind of blood pressure to get that blood pressure down is very important. Um, and then cholesterol medications. So even if you don't have low blood cholesterol, there's something called pleiotropic effects, uh, which are these magical effects of these statin medications that people are on. Um, and you know whether or not you have low cholesterol, we've, we've done multiple randomized control trials. And if you go on high-dose statin after you've had a stroke, it decreases your risk. Um, there's less uh, good evidence on those tiny strokes, so the lacunar infarcts, but they're still recommending that people that are um, 
uh, that have lacoons go on on statins and aspirin. So aspirin is quite quite common. Like if you haven't had a stroke in the past, the evidence is less compelling. So I'm, we don't tell everybody that has no cognitive impairment um, to to go and take aspirin for primary prevention because way too many people would have to get treated to cause benefit. And there's risks associated with it, like gastrointestinal bleeding and uh, high blood pressure and other things like that. So, um, but if you have had a stroke, then aspirin or Plavix are two medications that people are on quite frequently that prevent blood clots from forming both in the heart and in the brain. Um, so they can be they can be used as well. And then a whole host of medications for for diabetes that we talked about. And then that was the better. other. I was just going to say just uh, what we were saying before about the possibility of there being a mixed dementia too. So there might be uh, certain treatments, uh, you know, if you think the person has a mix of Alzheimer disease and vascular dementia, uh, there might be a, a, a trial of cognitive enhancers, maybe a warranty. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the nice thing about vascular disease is that there's the possibility of slowing or altering the trajectory of it. Not always, and usually not with the subcortical disease. Like we don't have good evidence that if you go on aspirin, you're going to benefit from that. But we do know that if you've had one stroke, you're at a high, uh, highest level risk of having another stroke. And so it's nice to be able to decrease the risk of having another stroke and decreasing, therefore, the risk of further pro um, progression in that situation. And then you're right, the, the treating the symptoms of the dementia would be very, quite similar to Alzheimer's disease in terms of you know, a cholinesterase inhibitor, um, the disease, the, the evidence is still there that it benefits. It's just a little bit less compelling than, than for the Alzheimer's, uh, patients. And then, um, you know, whether we needed to treat depression or anxiety or ap apathy, or sometimes the psychotic symptoms, you might use different medications, which we've talked about, I think, um, quite a lot in other, yeah. other topics. That was one of the other questions that came in. Uh, what treatment do you recommend for severe sadness and depression? Um, how can he be reassured by spouse and family? And I think, you know, the the decision to evaluate what treatment uh, is most appropriate is on a on a case by case basis. Usually if somebody does have, you know, severe depression, uh, a trial of uh, antidepressant medications would be indicated. Um, and in some cases, maybe even hospitalization if, if the person is uh, suicidal or not getting better with uh, trials of treatment. Um, reassurance may help in some cases, but it, uh, you know, usually some other form of an active treatment if the person is still, you know, cognitively able, something like cognitive behavioral therapy or a, a supportive psychotherapy, perhaps in combination with uh, antidepressant treatment may be, may be indicated. Um, so I think if, if you're worried uh, as a family member, it's worth talking to your doctor or your healthcare team about the concerns related to it. And also that sort of severe sadness and depression, as we were talking about before, sometimes people may present more with apathy, but it might be diagnosed as depression when it's, um, you know, maybe there are some other things that people could do to, if the diagnosis, uh, or the assessment is of apathy rather than depression. Um, what causes people with vascular dementia to fall backwards? And is there anything that can help with that? Or is it just part of this progressive disease? That's an interesting question because falling backwards is quite, is more on the rare side. Um, you know, most often when people are, are walking or, or turning, they'll, they'll fall forwards. Um, situations where they'll fall backwards is where there's a sudden loss of consciousness. Uh, so, you know, people could fall in any direction in that setting, um, or specifically a condition called progressive supranuclear palsy, where sometimes people will get rigid, or there could be the rigidity in, in the body itself related to some of the vascular changes, uh, from Parkinson's. So not always, and, and again, this is not professional medical advice because we always mm. need to see patients and stuff, but considering the Parkinsonism side of things and seeing whether the person's body is actually quite stiff, um, 
because usually people fall forwards, but if you're stiff and you lose your balance, you can fall backwards. So I think that's, um, that's quite important. And, and so getting assessed for the cause of falls is always the first thing. It's a very comprehensive detailed exam. So I think that's the first step. Um, and then there are treatments for falls a lot, you know, including exercise and vitamin D making sure that the person's uh, bone mineral density is up to date or bone thinning or osteoporosis has been treated. So I think there's, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Balance, balance retraining, uh, and uh, also, uh, assistive, assistive devices yeah. like using a walker. Um, but I would agree with you falling backward to me suggests more an alternate, uh, diagnosis, at least to be ruled out, uh, like, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, or even sometimes in Lewy body disease, people will sometimes fall backwards. But, um, are catatonic seizures common with strokes? Uh, that's not a, a typical term that we, we yeah. use. Uh, I would, I, I would say sometimes we see, uh, an unusual type of seizure, uh, called non-convulsive status epilepticus, which is a type of seizure that doesn't involve, you know, convulsions or shaking of, of the limbs, uh, but the consciousness is affected and it also kind of goes on. So the person can look catatonic because they may not be responding or moving when they're actually having a type of ongoing seizure, but that's fairly rare. And it isn't necessarily uh, associated with strokes. It, it, might be very, very rarely. It's certainly not a common thing, but otherwise we don't really talk about catatonic seizures. Uh, Strokes are risk factors for seizures. And so sometimes if somebody has had a a current stroke or an old stroke that might've led to some scarring, it can be a focus for uh, a seizure. Um, Is it common to not remember the spouse or feel emotion toward the spouse? Uh, not, and, uh, sometimes we should clarify, like remembering is sometimes recognizing, right. So, um, uh, which is a little bit different. There are parts of the brain where you process somebody's face and they appear to be, uh, they kind of synthesize what that person's face looks and your ability to recognize them, which is actually like a visual processing thing, as opposed to a memory change. And that agnosia, like a process agnosia, not being able to recognize somebody's face is more in keeping with uh, an Alzheimer's um, dementia. So it's not as, it's not as common with, uh, with vascular disease, unless there's a stroke to those particular areas of the temporal lobes. So it's kind of interesting. We always used to think it was this fusiform area, but now the anterior temporal poles seem to be quite important in, uh, in uh, in recognizing faces, I think I think the issue around emotion and emotional response is also a different one, and and that may or may not be tied in with uh, the apathy that is sometimes seen uh, in vascular dementia and other dementias. So I think it is important to distinguish the two. Um, but uh-huh. apathy or lack of emotional response can definitely be seen. Also, in some of the, if there is vascular Parkinsonism, that may affect, affect the facial expressiveness of the person, just like Parkinsonism. So that it, it can appear somewhat like a, a mask. Uh, so it doesn't look like the person is responding emotionally, but they might not fe- be feeling that on the inside so much, but they might have lost some of their uh, facial expressiveness. So. Um, we have quite a few other questions and not too much time. So I'm going to try to uh, go through, uh, here's one that was submitted earlier this week. Uh, my hubby has vascular dementia and has some clear days and others that he's totally off the rails, uh, their words, uh, why can it be so different one day to the next? Uh, he's also having a struggle getting out of any chairs. Is this connected with the dementia? It sounds like it. Um, it's quite frequent for people uh, that have all types of dementia to have good days and bad days. In certain conditions, they're more pronounced than others. So um, in our uh, live event on dementia with Lewy bodies and in the lessons of the different types, we kind of describe the fluctuations and level of consciousness and cognitive capacity as, as well as alertness. Um, so that's something to, to always consider in in the background, but yes, it's definitely possible. 
the challenge with getting out of chairs could be related to the a Parkinsonism uh, that Dr. Levinson was just describing. So sometimes with the body stiffness and um, challenge and, and stiffness of, of the, the limbs, it's a little bit more challenging to get out of chairs. So those are some things to, to consider, but definitely both of those can be related to vascular dementia as well as other types of dementias. What is the typical progression of vascular dementia symptoms and will dementia caused by a stroke necessarily progress? Great question. And it comes back to the very many, like the many different types and uh, uh, varieties of, of vascular dementia. So if you've had one stroke, you are at risk of having another one, and that could cause cognitive impairment. And you outlined some of the statistics of the progression in that mm -hmm. case at the beginning. Um, so if you're at a higher risk. Um, and the people that have really severe microvascular disease may have just a very steady progression of that. The answer is it's really variable and it depends on the underlying type of uh, cerebrovascular disease or low flow that you, you have. What are some possible non-pharmaceutical interventions for responsive behaviors for individuals with this type of dementia? Which do you suggest are the most effective? I think I would I would say it, it depends a little bit on which symptoms uh, you're aiming to. If it's something like apathy, you might uh, try, you know, certain types of social activities to engage the person. But often uh, what we see with apathy is the person's not bothered. It's the care partner that, that's bothered more. So education and just coming to accept that the person is not necessarily uh, upset that they're just not feeling motivated. Uh, so that can be helpful for the care partner sometimes. I think for, you know, depressive or anxiety symptoms, again, for depressive symptoms, you might try certain things like reminiscence therapy or music therapy. There's a small amount of uh, evidence around uh, some of those interventions for uh, milder depressive symptoms in, in patients with, with dementia. Um, it, in somebody who may have more uh, disinhibition uh, or maybe be a, a bit more unpredictable, uh, that can be that can be a bit more of a challenge. So um, looking to do an analysis of the triggers and making sure that there's nothing else, uh, you know, that they might be responding to me medically. Could it be a headache or pain or uh, something else? Uh, any any suggestions from from your side on that, Richard? No, well, I think that's great. Um, yeah, you mentioned all those things like tired, thirsty, hungry, all of, all of the things that they might be responsive to, and then also kind of um, the valid validation of of feelings or, or redirection. If if all of those other things are you, you can't find a clear cause, just you know, sometimes people need to feel heard or feel like you understand them. And so validating that they feel that way, even if it's not necessarily based on reality, um, very, that can be very helpful as well. And the, just the re redirection too. sometimes people will get very upset or angry and fixated on something. And, you know, it's not that dissimilar to people at the other end of the age spectrum where they can't necessarily control their emotions and, um, sometimes providing a distraction. So you don't just want to distract. Sometimes you need to validate and deal with the feelings, yeah. but also sometimes like, why do you want to watch a show or, oh, what's this happening over, over here? It just kind of gets them out of that negative kind of reinforcing feedback loop that they can't break out of in their brain. I think there was a comment here from, from somebody who I think had submitted an earlier question as well, just saying, um, thank you. My loved one was sweet and now they can be nasty and unfiltered. And I think it, it speaks to some of the challenges with some of the people with vascular dementia who may have had changes to their frontal lobes that can lead to, uh, you know, some of those types of behaviors where they really have that personality change and they have a short fuse. And, and that that's, a I think, one of the biggest challenges for care partners when, um, you know, it's, it's really almost it's not intentional from the person, uh, you know, living with dementia, but they've, they've lost that filter uh, through damage to those parts of the brain. Um, do you have a few more minutes? Can we stay for another five and, and try and 
get a few more questions done. Uh, for those of you who have to leave, uh, we can uh, we do record these. They'll be available through the website. Um, is edema usually a sign of vascular damage? Uh, so it can be. Uh, edema is quite complex as well, right? There's there's a lot of different causes, but um, not usually the arteries that are more implicated in the dementia side of things, but the veins. So if you have chronic venous insufficiency, then that can cause um, that can cause swelling in the lower extremities. Um, but also, if you've had you know if you have atherosclerotic disease and you've had heart attacks, that can lead to heart failure. And so that can cause swelling in the legs. So there's all these kind of secondary associations or some people, um, you know, you can get fatty liver disease, uh, which can be associated with kind of metabolic syndrome and gets inflammation in the liver and that causes cirrhosis and that can cause edema. So, you know, we've, we've just, that's barely covering the surface there, yeah. but yes, directly through venous problems and then indirectly uh, as a result of kind of the same processes that are associated with vascular dementia. Um, is frontal vascular dementia inherited? Uh, I would say no. I don't, I don't know of any particular inherited vascular diseases that cause a specific frontal dementia. I'm sure uh, we didn't mention it, and I'm not an expert in it, but the catacyl Mm. would be something that might cause uh, that's an inherited condition where you look like you have this vascular related, this sub subcortical disease, but it's very aggressive and it happens much earlier in life than you'd expect. So in your forties and fifties. And um, it may cause um, frontal symptoms, but not necessarily uh, exactly. more from the deep blood vessels, uh, like the example we saw in the MRI and that can yeah. run in families. So uh, that would be the, the one thing, or potentially if you had a, frontal predominant cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, but yeah, those, yeah. those could be two things. In, in general, no. I guess the, general, no. the vascular risk factors may, for a variety of reasons, kind of run in families. Some of them do. So you may still have some people who are maybe more likely to have um, blood vessel disease in the brain that is part of other risk factors that run in the family, but not necessarily... Uh, frontal focused vascular dementia. I think uh, this is what, sorry. sometimes too, like um, just the referral bias that we get to. It's like, I mean, you're going to see all of the more psychiatric laden or psychiatric yeah. symptoms. I see the older patients. So I generally don't see, like I've never seen a case of, of catacil before. Mm. I, I've seen some uh, younger patients with other sort of uh, genetic disorders um, for right. example, rare diseases like mitochondrial diseases that will lead to strokes and may also lead to, uh, impairment, but again, not necessarily frontal. Again, that those are conditions that seem to have a high degree of variability uh, from family member to family member. Oh, uh, hunting, Huntington's disease. I think you'd be remiss. Uh, if we didn't, I mean, Huntington's disease also has, um, the chorea or like the, the movement problems and neuropsychiatric symptoms, but it also can have a significant frontal component as well. And not necessarily vascular per se. So. No, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just a couple more and then we'll, we'll try to wrap up, but um, uh, what about Aricept? Uh, is it effective and how might it improve symptoms? And uh, a follow-up question about Aricept uh, why does it cause some to have nightmares? So uh, is it effective and how might it improve symptoms in vascular dementia? And why does it cause some to have nightmares? Yeah. So um, yes, it's effective. Uh, the areas where you might see it be effective are kind of global cognitive functioning. So not just not your memory per se, but all of the various areas in a composite fashion, people might function a bit better day to day. Um, Care providers might subjectively rate the people as performing better, and there might be less neuropsychiatric symptoms. So maybe a little bit less depression or a little bit less of the psychotic kind of features. And people that have it 
a bit of a challenge, as Dr. Levinson pointed out, is that you don't know 100% of the time whether they have just isolated vascular disease, whether they have vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. So oftentimes it's worthwhile treating if there's no contraindication. And if people tolerate it, then that's fine. I notice generally what I'm looking for in, in the vascular patients is hopefully a little bit of a decrease in the irritability. Um, because they tend to be a little early on in the disease, a little bit more irritable and emotionally um, labile. Um, and the nightmares, I, I don't know why it causes it. You, you boost levels of acetylcholine. And so in some people that, that can, can lead to these, these nightmares, but I don't know a more precise mechanism. Uh, but you can take it early. So sometimes people take it at night. And if they're having nightmares, then try taking it first in thing the in the morning with breakfast. Yeah. yeah. Um. Is falling asleep a symptom of vascular dementia uh, or Alzheimer's disease? Uh, not usually. So falling asleep during the day, persistently having headaches uh, during the day or having cognitive impairment and having somebody that potentially snores or stops sleeping at night, always think of obstructive sleep apnea. It's probably a very undiagnosed, underdiagnosed condition. So always consider that. The most common neurodegenerative condition is dementia with Lewy bodies. If people are sleeping two to four hours a day, that's one of the distinguishing factors versus Alzheimer's disease is that people sleep quite frequently and are quite somnolent during the day. So not generally vascular disease. Um, we do have a couple of other questions. Uh, I'll probably try to respond to people in writing uh, between now and our next event. And it, depending on uh, if we don't have time, we'll we'll add them to sort of uh, our next live event and try to try to cover those. I wanted to get through the, the main ones related to vascular disease. I wanna thank everybody for sending in such great questions. Um, I, Jerry Care was uh, developed uh, with support from the Canadian Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, powered by Baycrest, uh, the Jarris Center at Hamilton Health Sciences, McMaster University, the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation, the Alzheimer's Society Foundation of Brant Haldeman Norfolk, Hamilton Halton, and uh, our Division of eLearning Innovation team. Um, iGeriCare was also recently supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the CIHR, and Canada Health InfoWay with a grant to help us to translate uh, iGeriCare into French. So I did want to just uh, show show people uh, at the on the home page. There's a little language toggle. So uh, if you have uh, uh, friends or uh, family who are francophone, they can uh, access all of our lessons. Uh, in French now, as well as our uh, email based e learning. And they can also access our donate button, as uh, can you, because that's what makes uh, it possible to continue uh, to produce uh, updates to lessons, new lessons. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have a new review lesson on the site. And uh, we will be back with our next live event, uh, August 18th at one o'clock. So once again, as always, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Richard. And uh, of course, uh, teamwork makes the dream work. So thanks to the Division of eLearning team, and we'll see you next month. Thanks so much, Anthony. Bye now.